Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. You will listen to the amazing story of rewilding, an interview about how a large, very commercially driven farm just under London was destined to fail and how Isabella and her husband Charlie took a courageous decision to let their land rewild. This led to a lot of very surprising learnings about land management, wildlife and agriculture. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our Patreon community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or find the link below. Thank you. Today I'm interviewing Isabella Tree, an award-winning author and travel writer. Isabella lives with her husband, the environmentalist Charlie Brewer, in the middle of a pioneering rewilding project in West Sussex. Her book, Wilding, is taking the UK and also now Europe by storm and will be released this month in the US. Welcome, Isabella. Hello, welcome. Thank you. So could you give us a bit of a, a short intro for whoever who didn't read the book or hasn't seen you speak recently on why the rewilding project and also a bit of the scope of the book? So the story of wilding really is, is our story of what happened on our estate over the last 20 years. We inherited three and a half thousand acres, my husband and I, in West Sussex in south east of England from his grandparents in the 1980s. And it was intensive arable and dairy. And we fully expected to carry on being farmers, you know, conventional intensive farmers for the rest of our lives. For 17 years, we tried to make ends meet. It was already a failing enterprise when we took it on. We sort of assumed that, I suppose with the sort of arrogance of youth, we just assumed that it was his grandparents who hadn't been investing in infrastructure and didn't know all the latest technologies that, that had been making the farming business fail. So for 17 years, you know, we tried to do everything we could to make it efficient, to invest in infrastructure, to bring in better, bigger dairy herds, to make efficiencies, to diversify into ice cream and yogurt, we tried different varieties of crops. You know, we did everything a good farmer is supposed to do conventionally. And after 17 years, we the, the, our overdraft was higher than ever. I think we were one and a half million pounds in debt by that stage. And we knew we couldn't go on. The problem, we realized by 1999, was our soil. We are on very marginal land. It's grade three, grade four in agricultural terms. It's very heavy clay like porridge in winter and as hard as concrete in summer. I mean, you can literally put your whole arm down the cracks when the, when the clay is dry up to your shoulder. And we just could not farm this land. We couldn't be competitive. We couldn't grow spring crops in a wet winter. You literally couldn't get your farm, your heavy machinery onto the land for sometimes six months. So there was no maintenance you could do in that time, you know, we just couldn't compete with farms on better soil. And so we really looked around for an alternative. There was selling wasn't an option for us because this estate has been in the family for over 250 years. We wanted to do something that was going to work with the land rather than battling against it all the time. And it was in the year 2000, the year after we decided to give up in-hand farming and we'd sold our lovely dairy herds and we'd sold all our farm machinery and cleared our debts, that we met the amazing Dutch ecologist Franz Vera. And it was his ideas that I think are still kind of sending shockwaves through the ecological kind of community. 
his ideas about free roaming animals and allowing them to drive habitat creation in the landscape that we thought might be an amazing experiment to try on our land. If we could increase biodiversity by just a tiny bit on our severely agricultural, you know, post-agricultural soils, then we thought that would be an experiment worth trying. And so that's what we embarked on in the year 2000. And I mean, I think the first bit of your story resonates with a lot of farmers that are not on the most amazing soils of, of this planet. And yet many of them are even further in that because they continued. What was, was there a trigger? Was there a moment or what made you decide, okay, we don't want to sell, but we cannot continue farming. And so you basically somehow pulled the handbrake of the car and stopped the whole operation. Was there a moment to do that? Was there a journey? How, how did that happen? Because it's such a, a radical, if you look back, uh, radical decision. It was, a, it was a very big decision. And it was probably a decision that we had actually postponed too long. You know, when you look back at these things, uh, you know, if, you, if you've ever had the misfortune to be in a failing business, you you tend to postpone that that decision. You hope that something will turn up or that, you know, your fortunes will change somehow. I think one of the crux moments was when our farm manager, who was a friend, came to us and said, you know, we could make efficiencies here by amalgamating two dairies. And that was going to cost in the region of between quarter of a million and half a million pounds. And on paper, it made absolute sense. It would make us more competitive. It would make a lot of efficiencies. But we just didn't have the capital to do that. And we realized that we were endlessly having to fork out more capital just to try and keep up with the pace of change and with the pace of agriculture elsewhere. We just couldn't do it anymore. It was a, just a decision. We hit the buffers. But it was obviously very painful because... You know, farming had been in my husband's family for, you know, decades and decades. And it was what we had assumed we were going to be doing. You know, I, I think Charlie's aunt was grown up. She told me she, you know, you were grown up, you, you were you were brought up to believe that if you made two blades of grass grow where one had grown before, that's what you've got you to heaven, nothing else. <laughs> so the decision to stop farming, I think, was, you know, the family, I think, it was a difficult decision because I think they couldn't understand why we were doing this thing. It was an emotional response, I think. And our neighbors as well thought that we were being, I don't know, irresponsible. Some of us, some of them called us unpatriotic, you know, this idea that we should still be digging for victory like we were doing in the second world war and turning every available inch of our land over to food production but we knew we knew the writing was on the wall. We just couldn't afford to go on. So it was really economics that drove us into looking at alternatives. Um, I think my husband and I had always, you know, been interested in in a very amateurish way in in nature. You know, I'd been a travel writer for a long time. Charlie grew up in Africa and then and then Australia, and we'd always travelled to those places and really loved looking at wildlife. We'd never once imagined that we could have could or should have wildlife on our doorstep. Um, you know, I suppose we loosely considered ourselves stewards of the land, like most farmers do, but we really didn't know that much about nature. We thought we were doing okay, but it was only really when we met a wonderful man called Ted Green, who came to advise us on our ancient oak trees in the old park around the house that had once been a, a landscaped park. It was landscaped by a famous British um, landscape architect called uh, Repton. And that had been ploughed up in the Second World War during the Dig for Victory campaign to grow arable. And we hadn't thought about it. But when Ted came to see us and he showed us what our oaks, that our oaks were actually beginning to fail, they were growing very staggy and dying back, these lovely 300, 400, 500 year old oaks, because of what we were doing underneath them. We were endlessly plowing the endless chemical inputs of fertilizer, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, everything we were chucking on the soil. And of course, just the repeated plowing and plowing right up, pretty much up to their trunks. 
and these trees were suffering. And I think that was a that was an epiphany. We suddenly realised that these beautiful old trees that we looked out onto every day were dying, beginning to die, and it was because of what we were doing to the soil beneath them. And can you describe, I mean, it's almost impossible because it's a 20-year journey, but can you describe a bit how the land looks now? I mean, it's been ploughed to, between brackets, death, like many, many other agriculture lands. You decided to take it out of agriculture and then do something else with it. How does it, where did it go and, and how does it look now? Because you actually have uh, some very successful businesses on it and an Im amazing story of hope and, and change and nature on your doorstep, like you said, and wildlife that you never even expected. Well, how would you describe uh, your estate at the moment? Well, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, a lot of people who come and see our rewilding project say it reminds them of Africa. There's nothing like it. Sorry, there's nothing like it left in the British landscape, really, because it's thorny scrub, which is a habitat that we just don't tolerate anymore. I mean, whenever you have, you know, blackthorn, hawthorn, dog rose, bramble growing up in, in the landscape, it is just pulled out as soon as possible. Our hedgerows, if you're lucky enough to have them, are the only remnants of, of thorny scrub we have left in the landscape. And We lost 75,000 miles of hedgerow since the Second World War. So what we've got now popping up in our um, post-arable fields is this extraordinary sort of mosaic of thorny scrub, um, groves of willow, of self-hybridizing sallow. You've got water meadows. We've got a river which is renaturalizing and going flowing back onto the floodplain. So... Um, it's very dynamic, it's shifting, it's constantly shifting. And the key thing is we have these free-roaming animals. In a sense, they're proxies of the animals that would have been in our landscape before. Um, obviously, we don't have the auroch, the ancestor of the ox anymore. We don't have the tarpan, the original horse. But these animals would have been in huge herds roaming Europe and Britain. And so we can use their um, descendants as proxies and that's what we've done is we've put um, in low numbers we've put free roaming herds of old English longhorns who are um, being doing a very good job of being an aurochs and we've got Exmoor ponies being a proxy for the tarpan we've got wild um, we've got Tamworth pigs being a proxy for the wild boar and then we've got red deer, roe deer and fallow deer and so these animals are interacting constantly with the vegetation they're, they're the battle between their disturbance there's the way they rootle and trample the way they browse and graze and of course their dung their, their disturbance with their hooves the way they uh, trample the margins of the watery areas the way they debark trees and break branches all that interaction with the vegetation is what stimulates these amazing marginal messy fringe habitats, which is rocket fuel for biodiversity. So the idea really is that if you have a number of these animals in the landscape, you don't want too many, or you get the sort of overgrazed landscapes that we're familiar with in industrial farming terms, too few, and you get the scrub eventually evolving into closed canopy woodland, which is, a ve again, very species poor, quite static, relatively undynamic, It's not great for biodiversity. What you want is that clash between animal disturbance and the thorny scrub, the vegetation succession coming up. And then you get this landscape that looks like Africa, um, but actually it also looks like a lot of medieval Europe would have looked like in the past, so centuries ago. You've got uh, big open-grown oaks. You've got the new generation of oaks coming up through the thorny scrub, protected by the thorns from browsing. And then you've got open grazed areas, areas where for some reason the animals prefer to graze. They keep it very tightly grazed. Perhaps there's a mineral in the soil there that they, they're seeking out. You've got the water meadows and everything bleeding into each other in a kind of kaleidoscope. It's a very dynamic, shifting shifting landscape. It's it's very exciting, but it's it's very unfamiliar to the modern eye. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I, I would love to visit. I am planning next year, but I would love to take one of the safaris and, and see it 
for myself as I, I saw you present at Groundswell and there were quite some videos and photos which looks amazing. And actually in the book, there are a lot of beautiful pictures as well. And I think you, you touch upon a very important piece, uh, the imagination, that what really touched me in the book, often we have no idea of how a landscape would have looked without us or how, how a landscape would have looked five, six, seven, eight hundred years ago or a few thousand years ago. So we imagine if we leave agriculture land bare, it, it will grow back to a forest because we think back is a forest. But actually you're showing that with the right animals and with the right mix and, and you're going to great details of how to figure out that mix, it doesn't actually doesn't grow back to a forest, but it grows to much more messy and from a wildlife perspective and actually probably from an eye perspective as well, much more interesting landscape than we could imagine, but we don't have it anymore. So we somehow forgot about it. That's exactly it. And, you know, we have in our heads this sort of myth of a of the, the closed canopy forest. And, you know, it's sort of rather Freudian, I think, you know, man coming along with his axe and chopping it down and sowing his seed in the virgin soil and <laughs> creating agriculture, which was fantastic for biodiversity. And, you know, it, it all the, the science now is telling us the, the the most recent papers in the, from the pollen experts, from the fungi experts, from the fossil record, is showing us that it was actually a much, much more open, much more complex landscape, much more like you know Africa, the Serengeti, where you have you still have these big herds of free roaming animals driving the system. What's difficult, I think, for the modern eye is is that the modern perception is to accept it as something that it could be very beneficial for us. You know, we have a very fixed idea of what our landscape should look like, and it's it's been so managed for so long, so controlled. You know, we have canalized rivers, we have um, square edges to our fields. We um, like this sense of being in control of everything. And so what rewilding really is doing is is putting these animals in the driving seat and trying to step back and allow them to manage the landscape for you, which is very difficult for human beings being such control freaks that we are. Do you have an example of that? That you Because basically what you did is you removed a lot of the internal fencing, put a fence around and brought in and experimented with, obviously, a, a mix of animals. But that's pretty much it. It's not that you planted a lot of things. It's not that you but see the things, it was really the animals in the driver's seat, but how difficult was it to sit on your hands and not do anything when you thought, or you as a team thought that something was going wrong or was going not according to the plan? Well, it, it's so interesting because in the early days, it was quite difficult. I mean, I, I don't consider myself to be too controlling, but, you know, when you see it, just simply if you see a tree dying in the landscape, you know, as farmers, we were you know, we we were itching to get at the chainsaw to cut it down. But of course, that is a huge resource, that, that dead tree for all sorts of life. I mean, arguably, a, a dead oak, a hollowing out oak is actually more hospitable to species than a living oak. You know, it's absolutely astonishing kind of resource for for bats, for birds, for insects, for fungi, and so just leaving dead wood in the landscape was hard enough at the beginning. But we did have one sort of moment which was so memorable in the early days because we suddenly had creeping thistle that just came out and colonized. You know, it's an early pioneer species. And once we'd just taken our hands off the steering wheel and, and stopped farming and, and just stopped doing anything, you get these big kind of boom moments where where pioneer, spe pioneer species just come piling in and we had I mean tens and tens and tens of acres of land covered in creeping thistle and particularly in the in what had been the park around the house and just to describe creeping thistle what kind of plant is that creeping thistle it's a type of thistle and it's so it's very prickly it's got um a sort of a pink flower um it's, it can grow quite tall so sort of two, three foot, but it's a clonal species. So it can cover and colonize huge areas very, very quickly. And this started spreading all over the park and also into the northern block of, of our estate as well. And, you know, we have footpaths going through this. So there were a lot of neighbors, a lot of people walking who were kind of very disgruntled and thinking that it was very irresponsible of us not to be doing anything about it. We should be getting out there with the glyphosate and the toppers and getting rid of it. 
but we thought no we've you know we're trying to stick to our principles here we'll we'll just see if you know if if nature can manage this what will happen we we just don't know but we'll sit on our hands for a bit longer another year passed another year passed and my husband by then was really beginning to get worried and thinking you know we we could lose you know we 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 have um a countryside stewardship scheme grant for fencing and for restoring the park around the house and we were worried that actually we would lose our our funding because because of this creeping cliff on the outcry that was coming from the public um, seeing what was happening. If I remember correctly, the neighbours were, were complaining, were, were fearing that it would maybe also come to their land. I think even local newspapers got involved. It was, it was a really, really thorny subject. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thorny being the operative word. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then one summer, it was a lovely sunny June day, Sunday, we woke up and we saw these painted lady butterflies passing our window like tracer. And we just thought, this is really extraordinary. I mean, there was one every minute passing our window. And so we went outside to see where they were going and they were landing on this creeping thistle. And there must have been tens of thousands of these butterflies. It coincided with a huge boom in population for painted lady butterflies that were migrating from Morocco that year to Europe. And they all descended on all of them, but a hell of a lot of them descended on our creeping thistle. It's their food plant. And they started laying their eggs on the creeping thistle. And later that year, the caterpillars emerged and they started eating their way through all this creeping thistle. And we were left with these sort of like standing stripped stalks for miles That's what they left us with, like a kind of army had moved through, their encampment had gone, and they just left this kind of this wreckage. And the next year, we didn't have a single creeping thistle, not a single one. They, that some, maybe the, you know, the caterpillars eating all the leaves had weakened the plant somehow so that a pathogen came in or a virus or a rust or some combination of something. We don't know, but it literally wiped out the whole lot. And so now we're much more relaxed about it. When we see explosions of ragwort or St. John's wort or any other of those big pioneer species, weeds, um, you name it, we, we just know that sooner or later nature takes care of it. Nature doesn't like a monoculture. Sooner or later, some pathogen or pest will come in to, to get rid of it. But the most exciting thing was having had this area covered with creeping thistle for so long, that had enabled ants to come in. To, it had given them some protection from the, the grazing and browsing animals. It given them added protection for several years so that they could create their ant hills without being kicked over by the, the horses or the cattle. And... So you can tell now where that creeping thistle was by the number of anthills on the land. And so it had benefited a huge number of not just ants, but also uh, common lizards. It became a little refuge for common lizards for a few seasons. So again, those populations of insects and reptiles benefited from this, this, these boom years of, of the creeping thistle. And so we began to understand that actually... If you can live with boom and bust cycles, it's it's hugely beneficial beneficial for nature. It's it's part of the whole life cycle. I think it's one of the many many stories in the book that's just pushing you to think beyond what you think you know about land, nature, and wildlife. And I think there's another story of one of the birds. I don't remember which one that we or uh, scientists always considered to be a tree bird or, or a forest bird, actually. But you actually found out it's it's actually much happier in an open uh, landscape with a number of trees, but not necessarily a closed forest, just in terms of what we think, because we pushed it so far out that the only place it still lives is a forest. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely right. I mean, you're probably thinking of the nightingale. I mean, we're now one of the biggest breeding hotspots for nightingale in Britain. We also have, I mean, turtle dove numbers. You know, we're the only place in Britain where turtle dove numbers are increasing we're about to lose the turtle dove as a species from Britain in the next 10 to 15 years, according to the RSPB. And yet we, at NEP, it's increasing. We had 20 turtle doves um, last year. We've got 
lesser spotted woodpeckers. We've got peregrine falcons nesting in a tree. We've got all these incredibly rare species. So in a period of just 20 years, we've gone from being one of the most nature depleted landscapes you can imagine, a virtual biological desert, to being one of the most significant areas for nature in Britain. So if it can happen on our land, you know, in busy southeast of England, underneath the Gatwick stacking system, it can happen anywhere. But the nightingale really is one of our our kind of headline successes and, and again has astonished the scientists because where it's breeding at NEP, like so many of our species, is in the thorny scrub. It loves that dense protection of particularly blackthorn. It nests about a foot above the ground. So it wants to have very dense thorny protection around it so to protect it from predation. But equally, it needs to have foraging within reach of its nest so it can feed its young. And that is where we're seeing this huge proliferation of nightingales is in the thorny scrub. And yet in our guidebooks, our bird books, uh, the nightingale is described as a woodland bird. And that really is because it was in the absence of any, any scrub in our modern landscape in Britain, the nightingale had retracted into woodland and it was clinging on in places where there was coppice, which provided the same sort of protection for it. But it's not where it really prefers to be. It, it, it really flourishes when it's, it's out there in thorny scrub, when it's, it's got perfect place to nest, and when it's got a proliferation of insects that it can feed on and that it can feed its young. So it was a lesson for us very early on, I think, in our project that where we describe species as wanting to be in modern modern times is not necessarily where they want to be. We forget that we're we're looking at them in such a depleted environment that they're often just clinging on to places by their fingernails. They're in places where they're only just managing to, to survive. But what rewilding offers you is um, because you're not targeting particular species, because you're just waiting to see what turns up, nature reveals itself to you. So these species suddenly come flooding into areas that you wouldn't ever have imagined them wanting to be. And they suddenly succeed. They do incredibly well. So they're showing you where they would prefer to be given half a chance. It's it's fascinating. I think it's, it, it shows... It's a small story on on one bird, but I think it's uh it's probably let imagine how much else we don't know or imagine in the wrong place or imagine with the wrong feed just because we pushed it there or just because out of necessity uh, this species this animal or also these plants are just clinging on on the last 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 remaining place that's left, but it's not their ideal habitat by any means. There's so much we don't know on that yes, exactly. There's so much we don't know. And I think a lot of letting go, you know, in rewilding terms and standing back is in a sense, I think it is to accept a, a bit more humility. You know, it's, it's, to, it's to observe nature and to, and to recognize that actually nature has been around for millions and millions and millions of years <laughs> of doing, you know, research and development. And so it, you know, we can't even hope to understand every facet or every every tiny permutation of what makes, say, a purple emperor butterfly population successful, particularly things with complicated life cycles like our insects or, or like the microbes in the soil. We're only just beginning to understand what a healthy soil looks like or what it should be. And so I think that one of the most sort of profitable or positive things that rewilding can do for us is to allow us the space to learn again and what nature can provide and how it can bounce back and readjust itself if we just let go and, and let it do its thing. And uh, I think it's a extremely wise words of, of the, how much we don't know and how much I think Charles Massey calls it an emergent mind, how much we should learn by not doing but observing and then maybe interacting like you're doing with the animals, but on a very, very smaller scale than we're currently doing in many, let's say, land management systems. Yes. I mean, that, that's it, really. I mean, we, 
we are only three and a half thousand acres. So we, you know, we, we can't, you know, we, there is a sense that the smaller the area is, you know, the more you have to intervene. We're not Yellowstone. We don't have apex predators. We don't have a huge, fully functioning, fully connected ecosystem. But it is a way just by managing the animals that we're using. And of course, that provides us with an income stream, which is hugely useful. We are still producing meat. We produce 75 tons of organic, free roaming, pasture fed meat. And, you know, that there is, I think, a, you know, an increasing market, a increasing appetite for ethical, you know, pasture fed meat. So that is one income stream that we're seeing from the way, you know, we can, we can manage a system in a, a much wilder sense on our land. It's a, it's a great bridge. I was going to ask it, indeed about a few of the, the streams and about the funding and how did you, how did you manage? Because you sold your quotas, you sold your herds, you sold a lot of your machinery. And I think you came pretty much out of debt. You were at more or less zero, if I remember correctly. Yes, that's right. And from there, how did you manage to fund this transition? And you're still in that transition, obviously, and you don't really know where it's going to end. But how did that happen? Well, we still have, we still got, uh, we still do get it, the basic farm payment. That we know is going to be phased out post-Brexit, dare I even mention the word. And we also get an agri-environment funding. Again, it's a European subsidy. It's a grant called Higher Level Stewardship that we get for doing what we're doing, which is improving our soils and providing biodiversity. But we anticipate that to go to post-Brexit. We don't know what will be there in its stead. We hope still that people, farmers, land managers will be rewarded for treating their, for, for recovering their land, for actually managing it in a much more responsible way. So we hope there will be payments and it's sketched out in draft form at the moment. And this program called Environmental Land Management Scheme, ELMS, which the government hopes to reward land managers who recover their soils, who stop ploughing, start doing regenerative agriculture, who are looking after their water sources, who are providing habitat for wildlife, who are sequestering carbon, that these things will be quantified and you will be rewarded in some sense for them. So you won't just be rewarded for producing food irrespective of where whether that land is the best land for producing food, that will go. It will be a much more holistic approach to, to land management that you'll be kind of required to, to do in order to get your payments. But that said, you know, I think it's, we're personally, you know, kind of nervous about being reliant on ed- any subsidies because I think, you know, governments come and go and we don't know what the future holds. We'd much rather be self-sufficient and entirely stand on our own feet. So at the moment, we have a very healthy income stream from our meat. We hope to be developing that soon. So we'll be selling direct to the public, perhaps even developing a kind of wild range creditation so that it will be a sort of beyond organic creditation for meat that consumers can trust and know that it's not only healthy and organic, but it's actually connected to a conservation project. And maybe even we can start selling as more rewilding projects come online we could start selling their meat through our our sort of umbrella business too and we hope to you know produce charcuterie and you know products other meat products traditional you know lard and bouillon or you know beef stock that kind of thing good for invalids in hospital so we hope to be developing our meat brand But we also have um, now an ecotourism business, and that's been very exciting. We've had so many people wanting to come and visit NET because of our extraordinary wildlife successes that we thought, well, why should people have to travel the ends of the earth to see wildlife? Why not set up a sort of a safari business like you would have in Africa with safari vehicles, take, take people out with really good guides who know their birds, who know the wildlife, who can teach you what to look at and you can also stay in tree houses and yurts and it's incredibly comfortable like a sort of african safari kind of base camp and you can also come and camp you know put your own tent in a wildflower meadow 
And so that's been incredibly exciting. And, you know, we, we now have thousands of visitors a year that we've probably reached capacity for, for the safari business. But our little shop there continues to grow. The business, I think, as, as a whole turned over about 300, 350,000, I think, last year. And that's in its fifth year of operation. And we make about a 20% margin on that. And we'll grow our little farm shop, I think, over the next few years. And then the third income stream, which I think is really interesting as well for farmers and land managers who might be thinking of doing something similar, is once you've given up intensive farming, you have a huge number of buildings that previously were just costing an arm and a leg to keep the roof on. You know, they weren't bringing in any any money. They were just part of the infrastructure of this big sort of industrial scale farming. And and you were using them to park machineries and, yeah. and pesticides, etc. And to store grain and that kind of thing. And now we, we're restoring them and converting them into a space for light industrial use, for office space and for storage. And so those, those buildings, those post-agricultural buildings, are now rented from us by different businesses, different small businesses around us, you know, people who don't want to sit in a traffic jam every day. There's a big market for little businesses that want to be in the countryside and look out of their windows onto something beautiful. And so we found that to be very profitable. And those businesses that are renting the post-agricultural buildings off us now are employing 200 people. And so those people aren't directly, obviously, um, employed by us. That's 200 jobs back into the countryside. And we reckon that that's as many jobs as were on NEP in 1750. So it's not agriculture, but it's getting people back into the countryside too, which is a really interesting development. And it's getting a lot of energy and people, and if you consider them part of wildlife, back into uh, on, onto your land, basically. Yes, absolutely. We're even beginning to find that, you know, we, we have uh, tenancies and cottages that we rent, that, you know, people are actually coming to us now wanting to rent at NEP to be within the rewilding project. So, you know, that's a really interesting aspect, I think, again, for farmers who might be going down this this route. You know, if they have any cottages or barns or conversions to let, if you are, you know, changing from an, a sort of rather unappealing industrial industrially farmed landscape, into a rewilding project and you have wildlife back in your landscape, I think there's a real hunger now that the general public are feeling to get out into wild spaces again. And so that obviously has a a benefit if you're wanting to rent property or rent um, office space. And I can completely imagine why would you prefer to be be in a traffic jam, drive into, into London in this case, because you're close to that, and be in an office where you're looking at other offices and then at the end of the day do the same back again if you can have a relatively fast internet and look at a, an amazing basically safari landscape around you and have a walk when whenever you want and probably eat really well as well just to just to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's not such a difficult sell yeah. no, we, we have some, some very satisfied tenants <laughs> i can imagine and in terms of because i can hear some farmers thinking this all sounds amazing but I'm in a place where there are no grants available to do this, or I'm in a place where I, I would love to continue farming. How do you see wilding and rewilding within the larger farming and maybe specific regenerative agriculture? But let's see uh, where, where we go with that. How do you see it as a within a larger farming and agriculture space, landscape and industry? Yes. I mean, I think obviously, you know, we're always going to need land to provide food. But the crisis that's facing us is the degradation of our soils. And we know that having neglected our soils for the last few decades, what is happening to our our land? I mean, different figures are banded about. So some people say that we have 100 harvests left in the planet before our topsoil is so degraded that we can't grow crops at all. We certainly have areas in Britain, like the Fens, where we only have 15 15 years of harvest left before that topsoil is gone. It's 1-5 uh, not 5-1. That's 1-5, wow. yeah. And so, you know, we're really facing a sort of a crunch point here. I think even, you know, in our big agricultural belts, we really have to now switch and understand 
the importance of switching to sustainable, not just sustainable agriculture, because we don't want to just keep the status quo. We have to do regenerative agriculture. And so where I think rewilding comes into play is certainly in marginal farming areas like ours, which never should have been turned over to agricultural, uh, sorry, to, to arable farming. It's just not suitable for it. You know, we shouldn't be encouraged. We will no longer be encouraged to grow arable on land like ours. So marginal land is perfect for rewilding. But I don't see rewilding just being in the margins. I think it's really important that we have uh, really wild areas through all our landscape. We need to connect our little tiny oases of nature reserves, some of which in England are only 10 hectares or so, some of them are even one hectare, they, they are doomed to fail if they remain isolated. They're little tiny islands in a kind of industrialized landscape. So we need rewilding to connect these areas. And whether you have big areas like Network, which are kind of become breeding hotspots, and then you can join it up with rewilded corridors and stepping stones, but we know also that having wild areas, having nature back in the landscape also benefits our agricultural systems. We know that having nature uh, running alongside our, our crops actually increases the yield of our crops. It increases the, the sort of dynamic of, of how insects can actually control pests. So... If you want to have an integrated system working alongside regenerative agriculture, you know, rewilding, I think, is it's going to be its greatest ally. And we should allow that space for nature everywhere in our landscape, running through it, even running through and alongside our, our regenerative agriculture. Yeah, and I think it could be a great almost laboratory and library of discovery of what is actually possible. Of Definitely you might do on X part of your land, let's call it 80%, let's say commercial regenerative agriculture. But on the other pieces, you're discovering what could be possible or what is possible, what kind of the, the amount of wildlife or what kind of plants, etc., could emerge if you do it at scale and if you actually sit on your hands and not do even regen egg, which is very operational, very management, obviously. So I think it's an integral, integral part. Absolutely. And my husband, who's on the um, environmental board of Ingleby Farms, which has 100,000 hectares across the, the world in different places from Peru to Latvia to, to uh, New Zealand, they have, um, uh, they set aside, you know, between 15, I think, it, I think it's about 15 to 30 percent of their land for nature. So they take it out of agriculture and, and, and have returned it to nature. And they found that their yields are still as high as they were before because that nature is responding and actually interacting with the, the 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 agriculture itself. So you're you're you know you're increasing your yields. Your your water systems are functioning again. The knock-on effect of having nature close to your your farming systems is, is absolutely huge. And I think we're only just beginning to understand how that can work. And to have nature close to us. But I think it's at the same time for any traditional conventional farmer extremely scary because you're bringing all the enemies he or she mostly unfortunately he has been fighting for the last 30 years super super close to your field of all your commercial crops so it's also this scary like we don't want nature to be too close because it might hurt or we've always been told it actually hurts our business absolutely i mean it runs completely counter to everything that we know we as farmers have been taught for, for decades and decades it's a completely the other side of the coin. So it's going to be incredibly painful and incredibly shocking, I think, to many farmers to have to face up to, to the changes that are going to have to be made. But they will have to be made. We know the writing is on the wall. I mean, I think extremely, you know, really exciting things are happening in America and in, in Australia where farmers like us have gone bankrupt. And that's really where where the the in innovation comes is when you really cannot afford to put any inputs on your land anymore. And you have to start thinking imaginatively and working with what you've got. And so I think, you know, there, I hope that there will be rewards in terms of recognition for ecosystem services, for public goods that 
will help the transition of from conventional industrial farming to regenerative farming. But I think also, you know, we need to start employing the polluter pays principle to farming. For for too long, I think farmers have been allowed to get away literally with murder, environmental murder. And we really have to start saying you can't do this anymore. And if you are polluting your water sources, if you are putting excessive nitrates and chemicals on your land, you are going to have to pay for that. Why should the general public have to pay for a resource that really should be common to the, the planet? Uh, why should the, we, we have to pay in additional increased water bills because of the water companies having to take the nitrates and the soil runoff out of our, our water? Why should, should the consumer have to pay? So I think that, that those, those you know, sort of paradigms will shift, I think, once those kind of considerations come into play. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think there's one a point I wanted to make you make repeatedly in the book as well. And I think it's very clear, but it's, it never hurts to repeat. This is not about putting a fence around a piece of land and letting it go. What you did very deliberately and, and just almost giving it back to nature and then not doing anything. Now, because if no big animals would have returned to your land, it wouldn't have rewilded like you did some very specific management decisions. It wasn't just hands off completely. You know, you really made, the, uh, you facilitated in this case, uh, large animals to come back and you brought them there to make sure that it, it went on that path. So it's not enough to just take our hands off it completely because it's in most cases has been degraded too far to return on its own or there are no big animals around that come back because we've shot them all. Exactly. You're absolutely right. And Yeah, so we're just beginning to realize that um, large herbivores are keystone species and they can kickstart the, the dynamism. They can actually, it's almost like they inject the dynamism back into the landscape again by, by creating habitat. So it's almost like pulling a glider back up into the sky so it can fly. You need these animals out there to move the land out of the catastrophic shift that intensive farming has put it into. So, for example, I mean, a, a, a perfect example of a, of a keystone species uh, and a herbivore is a beaver. And we would love to have beavers at net because they would add an even, even more dynamism. Uh, dynamism. There'd, there'd be another aspect that, that we're missing that would come back to NEP. And we have just um, applied for our license to release beavers at NEP. And we're, we're waiting with everything crossed to see if, if we'll get permission to, to have them at NEP. That would be absolutely amazing. I want to be conscious of your time and end with a final question. And that would be about the neighbors. I mean, you've mentioned them before. And I think anybody around it has been extremely skeptical for many good reasons, uh, I think, from the beginning. How is the current response? Because you're employing a lot of people. You have a lot of businesses actually on your land. Uh, what's the current? Is there curiosity? Are people copying it? Are maybe other people... Um, looking at you and at the project to be inspired. What's the current energy around the project? Yes, yeah, so we, we had a lot of, you know, your sincerely disgusted letters written to us in the early days. And now what's really lovely is we're getting quite a few letters of apology saying, I'm so sorry, I, I sent you a very rude letter um, 15 years ago, but I now see that there was method in your madness. And Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's wonderful. And, you know, that, that actually... You know, a lot of a lot of the complaints were aesthetic, actually, you know, that they didn't like the mess and how it looked. And it's changing that aesthetic, which I think is so difficult. But gradually, neighbors and people visiting us are, I think, beginning to appreciate NEP is, that is beautiful in a different way. It is messy to our conventional mindset, but it's also incredibly productive. And that feeling of being surrounded by life and surround sound birdsong and humming, thrumming, buzzing insects everywhere is just so thrilling that it is beginning to shift people's, people's sense of, of what the landscape should, should and could look like. But it is very difficult. I think we have a lot of people coming to see us now really intrigued by the idea of rewilding. My husband, Charlie, likes to, to clock up the, the acreage. So we had um, people in total who owned a million acres last year coming to visit NEP looking at, at rewilding their own land. So that's quite significant. And I think this year we'll have had about another million acres walking through the doors. And so there's a huge interest out there, but it is one thing, I think, to come to NEP and say, 
we love what you're doing, it's incredible. And then to go away to your own land and make that leap of faith and change that landscape so dramatically. I think it's a lot of it is, la- is down to aesthetics, changing the way we think our landscape should look like. And it's really about how learning how to be messy again, how to stop being a kind of, you know, that, that sort of Victorian corseted control freak that, that we are and to let go. And I think human beings find that very difficult to do. So in a sense, I think rewilding, you know, it comes down to aesthetics again, and it is about a mindset and about learning how to rewild ourselves. I don't think I could have wished for a better ending of this podcast. I'm so thankful for your time. I know you're on holiday and you decided to go in and make time for this interview. Thank you so much. I'm very much looking forward to visiting and seeing it and doing a safari in Europe, which I never thought would be possible. And uh, good (laughs) luck with your uh, book launch in the US and obviously also your tour there. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed speaking to you and uh, and I hope I look forward to seeing you at Annette sometime. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Isabella and learned how much we don't know about agriculture, land management and wildlife. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, If this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc, etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning, I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, and what kind of co-investors you could find, or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soil builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design, and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking, click on the link below, sign up and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.